today in our hot seat, we got Roland Hofkens, who is the Chief Product and Technology Officer at LanguageWire. Hi, Roland. Good to have you here. Hi. Thanks for having me. Of course. So, Roland, are you ready? Shall we do this? Yep, let's go. I'm ready. Welcome to C-Suite Hot Seat, the show where we put C-level executives from language service providers of all sizes in the hot seat. We will ask tough questions and get inspired answers. Our hosts today are Nimsi's Inga Boonin, VP of Consulting, and Sarah Hickey, VP of Research. Huland, in one sentence, tell us, what does your company actually do? We provide a team and services and technology um, to enable our customers to reach their global audience um, worldwide. Yeah. At the moment, you're Chief Product and Technology Officer, but as your first, the first career that you dreamt of having a kid, was that that or was it something rather different? <clears throat> no, no, it wasn't that. Um, <clears throat> Well, it, it, it was also something uh, to do with technology. Um, so uh, actually, I wanted to build rockets. That was my first uh, career dream. Um, I was fascinated by um, these things that fly in space and, and these big machines that take people to the moon. So um, I wanted to be part of that. Yeah. Wow. And in your free time, do you still spend your time like that? So that's the next <laughs> question. When you're not working, how do you like to spend your time? Yeah, space and all the technology and, and explorations are, are still something that I'm, I'm really interested in. So I, I read a lot about that, but my you know uh, interest in technology go a bit broader than that nowadays. Yeah. If you were given a chance to visit three different countries, which ones would you choose and why? Oof. Um, well, I, I would visit more countries than just three, that's, that's <laughs> for sure. But um, the first uh, one that comes to mind was uh, is, is, is uh, Madagascar. Um, mm -hmm. I, well, why? Well, I, I've actually been there already quite some time ago, but it's such a beautiful and huge island that there's still so much more to see i'd love love to go back there mm. um well number two let me think um yeah um i, I love islands um so the wow. the whole islands uh, around the, the east of um um I think, uh, indonesia that that's also a place oh. that i explored a little bit but there's a, still a lot more to see there and it's, it's so beautiful also for diving um and I'm, I'm quite fascinated by a country um well by japan actually uh, i've mm. never been there but that's also very high on my list uh, it's it, it's different but still very intriguing i think beautiful place and great food also what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given Oh, um, yeah, that's, well, I, I think at some point in time when I was uh, a student, um, I had some, some doubts if I should continue my studies in, uh, in engineering. You know, there's so many things to choose from when you're young and, and, um, <clears throat> I was like, yeah, maybe I should do something else like philosophy or whatever for a while uh, but um <clears throat> then i think the best piece of advice came from virtually everyone in my circle of friends like you know this is what you have been interested in all your life just continue because that's really your thing right um right. and I'm, I'm so happy that i did that so because this this is indeed it is um, what i like and do best <laughs> yeah Okay, so I feel like we know you a little bit better now, but uh, we want to crank it up a notch in the hot seat. So aside from profitability, what are the three main things that you spend your time on? First of all, for me, um, you know, working in technology is, is it's a, a 
lifelong learning journey. So I, I spend a lot of time in, in, in looking at new things, new developments, uh, how they could apply for our business, uh, how we can use them to make things more efficient or to, to offer new things to our customers. Um, so taking that in from learning to, to the second part, trying to innovate things that these are two things that I'm, I'm constantly um, <clears throat> uh, working on. Um, <clears throat> and then the third part uh, is equally important for me that these are the, the people that, that mm -hmm. we work with, right? So <clears throat> you can have the greatest ideas, but you, you need a, the right team to, to actually implement mm -hmm. them, to make them reality. And mm -hmm. that is something um, <clears throat> building that, team and, and making sure that people are, are happy. Um, I think that that's a, a very um, interesting other part of, of being a, 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 an engineer. Um, and I, I like that very much as well. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, um, how do you motivate your team? I think what's super important is that the team understands what um, <clears throat> value they're adding uh, and, and, and making sure that they are part of, of creating um, that strategy, like what are we going to build? What What is it that will help our customers, that will help our uh, colleagues in, in the, the um, project management part, for example, and seeing that what they built is actually being used and that it makes people's lives easier. That's, that's definitely, um, I think, mm -hmm. the, the biggest motivational factor that I see. So including the teams in, in, in those journeys. And um, what would you say makes you a great leader? Well, <laughs> but I, <laughs> I hope that people think that that uh, is the case, uh, but it, it's, it's definitely um, an, uh, an attitude of you know, being there to help not being there to command, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what I mentioned before about the motivational factor is, you know, it's, it's showing people, okay, this is these are options where we want to go. What is what is your input, right? So trying to create that momentum where we cooperate, where we work together and help each other, and, and um, that's that's also what I'm trying to do there, help people. Um, that That is uh, something that I, I hope makes leadership and also interesting for the people in the team. In life and in business, there's always uh, failures as well, right? We make mistakes and we hopefully <laughs> learn from those mistakes and it's part of the process. So um, with that, what was your biggest failure uh, throughout your career maybe, and what have you learned from it? Yeah, well, it's uh, I, I made a lot of failures, that's for sure, and and, and I definitely don't see failure as something um, that is that is is bad uh, as long as you learn from it, right? Um, it's hard to pinpoint a, a single biggest thing, um, but I think um, uh, what I would definitely say is uh, maybe something not not so technical, um, but it's it's you know. At the beginning of uh, my career, maybe not thinking big enough. Um, so thinking, um, <clears throat> you know, I was a bit constrained by, by okay, yeah, we have to stay in this box uh, until I really saw that, you know, by you know, taking risks and, and doing experiments and, and taking that new technology in your hands, that you can actually achieve things uh, <clears throat> that are much beyond of, of the, the secure zone, right? So mm -hmm. um, I think that was a big learning early in my career. Taking a look, look at the company now, uh, what would you say was uh, a big waste of time in your organization? Oof. Um, well, in the current company that I'm working for now, um, I, I think um, we spend quite a bit of time trying to figure out machine translation um, when it was still quite young mm -hmm. um and and we pursued a few roads there that were definitely not not worthwhile um so i, I would consider the the early experiments that we did uh, there um were not very successful but then i wouldn't call it a waste of time because there were still learnings from it right mm -hmm. so maybe we spend a lot of, of effort without uh, having a, a real result but it it prepared uh, the, the the way for what we're doing now. So without it, we probably wouldn't be in, in that advanced machine translation area that we're in now. Do you have a, a pet peeve when it comes to clients? 
Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, I do actually. Um, <laughs> th there's there's one thing um, that I do not understand is you know we talk about um, content, we talk about sensitive content, GDPR compliance, and then <clears throat> um, everything good. Uh, you know, the system is secure, and we can deliver a secure service, and then customers always insist to send all of these sensitive documents by email um, <laughs> it, instead of using a secure delivery platform or encryption or that, that, that. And, and and no that, that's where it stops I'm always a bit amazed by that there's a lot of thinking about security but when it comes to practice there's still a lot of things that we need to change so. that is actually an excellent point <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hopefully a lot of clients are listening <laughs> and can learn from this so looking back at your uh, maybe early career as well, um, what was your own personal uh, kind of breakthrough moment? Did you have one in your career where you were like, okay, I'm on the right track, I'm doing something right, you know, can you recall something there? Well, definitely a, a breakthrough moment was uh, <clears throat> when, uh, uh, when I decided to, to you know, built um, my own company with uh, a couple of colleagues uh, from uh, the British Telecom where I was working at that moment. So where we uh, founded the Amplexer in Belgium at that time. And that was uh, really a, a big change um, from, you know, being an employee to making all the decisions yourself. And that was that was mm -hmm. still quite early. Uh, I, was, I was, what, 29 at that time. So that was definitely a, a huge change and, and a huge enabler also. And uh, what inspired you to start your own company back then? Why did you go from, okay, <laughs> I, you know, being an employee yeah. to I wanted to do my own thing? <clears throat> so many um, <clears throat> customers, uh, at, uh, it was an internet service provider where I worked at mm -hmm. that time, and, and they needed uh, solutions to, to manage uh, websites at scale. We were talking here in 99 or something like that. Uh, and um, in the content management industry, there was virtually nobody doing implementations of, of, of content management systems in Belgium at that time. Um, so we saw this opportunity uh, um, and um, well, we took it with both hands. So that, that was the, 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 the reasoning behind it. Yeah. Was there a moment that you realized uh, maybe, you know, um, like you had the right recipe or you needed to do something different in order to advance, you know, that, um, I don't know, something that pushed you to really go for it there or... Um, mm. yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, we saw a lot of demand, but also uh, the people that I worked with, I, I knew that these were the right guys because mm -hmm. we had been working together uh, so closely. And if you feel that that energy is maybe not, you know, very rational, but it is, you have to sometimes mm -hmm. also, you know, feel the team spirit. And, and that, that was what actually convinced me, okay, let's let's do it. This is the right thing. Did you learn something specific from that time? Something that you, you know, if you wanted to give advice to young entrepreneurs starting their own business in the language industry, what would that be? That, you know, don't, don't be afraid to, to take your chances uh, because uh, this is, uh, there, there are so many opportunities in um, the language industry. There, there's so much content being created um, and we, we still need fresh IDs, right? Um, so, and especially now with what you have available in, in the AI space, uh, I think there's tons of opportunities. So if you think that you have a good ID, validate it um, and, and go for it. But there's so much opportunity in the language industry, so much potential. What would you say is the one thing that is missing right now in our industry? Something that you would like to see? Mm. Well, there's, there's, there's many things. I, I, I don't think that there's necessarily something that is that is um, <clears throat> missing per se. That there's things everywhere, but uh, but still very much at the beginning um, is is the whole um, <clears throat> AI assisted content authoring. Um, <clears throat> and I think as a industry, we tend to focus more on on um, <clears throat> you know when the content is already there, we'll translate it. But how can we uh, also assist um, in, in, you know, actually creating that content? Um, it's uh, about assisting humans, you know, 
kind of a, a, a pre-translation step, but then in the pre-content authoring. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the technology is, is there to make people a lot more um, effective and, and productive. Uh, but um, it, it's still very, very young. And um, that's something uh, where I think the, the industry has a big chance of, of um, actually adding value. Yeah. I always feel with these things I could go on forever. I have a very long list of questions. <laughs> uh, sure. uh, yeah. Hope I didn't jump around too much. It's a bit of a, there's less of a thread yeah, than when we do regular interviews. You know, it's mm -hmm. just more of a, this question, this question. But I think you sure. did really well. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. That was nice. Mm -hmm. If anyone else feels like letting off some steam and you're part of the C-suite at a company in the language services industry, sign up with us if you dare to sit in our hot seat. Thank you so much for watching and watch out for our next episode, which will be published on Multilingual TV and also as a podcast on the NIMSI website. Um, so yeah, see you all there. And thank you again for joining. 